Welcome. Thank you. Thanks Thank for joining you. us. It's I'll a drop pleasure off. to be here. I'll drop off and let you have the floor for your presentation. We okay, I will it. share my screen. Okay. And, uh, All right. Um, so you can see my screen and hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so I am Sandy Irani. I'm in the computer science department at UC Irvine. And I've been involved with teaching quantum computing here for a few years now. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about my experience getting into the field and developing curriculum for it. Um, as well as where I see sort of uh, education going and some of the future curriculum that's being developed. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit first about how I started off in the field and my own background. So I um, worked for many years developing algorithms in a completely different area than quantum. So I worked on algorithms with applications and computer systems. So I looked, worked on say memory management, how to manage caching pages, power saving algorithms, CPU scheduling, load balancing and distributed systems, all with a very concrete application in um, classical uh, computer systems. And sort of the unifying theme of what I work on, and this is still true today, even in quantum, is that I'm a theoretical computer science, meaning that the mode of research validation is mathematical proof. So typically what I would do is design an algorithm for one of these problems, and then mathematically show that it achieves a certain running time or a certain performance. So if you look at my research papers, they're typically sort of theorem proof format and less about sort of numerical experimentation. Um, about, I would say 13 years ago, uh, I decided that I needed to change and I had a pretty radical change in my research focus. Um, and so I set out to learn about the field of quantum computing. It had been sort of going on for quite some time, but I was interested in learning about it. Um, and so I set out to learn it and sort of start to work in this area as my, my own field of research. So I basically learned quantum computing by in many of the ways that um, people are now, which is basically over the internet, finding courses and learning through them. So how did I start? Well, I started actually at UCI and I took a class in physical chemistry. So this is just a very standard chemistry class that's offered to every chemistry major. And they go through the principles of quantum mechanics. But the focus here instead of qubits is actually on the hydrogen atom. So the fundamental object of study is the hydrogen atom. And so we're taught about quantum mechanics, the basic principles. And through the course of the semester, um, we start with the sort of the basic equations governing the hydrogen atom and then derive the shapes of the orbitals, which was really cool, um, but not quite what I was looking for in terms of my own, um, it was great background, but not quite what I was looking for in terms of my own um, research interests. Um, I found the course notes of a course taught by Umesh Fazarani in the CS department at UC Berkeley. And Umesh was one of sort of the pioneers of quantum computing on the computer science side. Um, and this course was great. It went through all of the fundamentals about qubits, some of which Kanav already sort of mentioned in his talk, um, and went through sort of the, the, make, the rules and governing, you know, what kinds of operations you can do on this data, how to measure, how to extract the output of your problem. And then it was a survey basically of many of the algorithms that had been developed so far on an idealized quantum computer. So let's say that you can build any circuit you want without noise, what is it that you can hope to compute with that? And so there had already been by that time, many, uh, a lot of fundamental progress. We covered Shor's algorithm for factoring numbers, uh, Grover search. Um, and this course in many ways formed the blueprint for many quantum computing classes around the country, including my own. So at this point though, I was having a little trouble reconciling these two views of quantum mechanics. Um, on one hand, there's the hydrogen atom, which looks like a continuous model. I mean, the laws of quantum mechanics do result in sort of a discrete orbital set, but the position of the electron is, is a continuous thing. And then on the other hand, you have these qubits, which are 
you know, a superposition of zero or one and zero and one are discrete states. And I, I couldn't really sort of uh, reconcile these two different views. And then I happened upon yet another course, which was taught jointly um, in also at UC Berkeley between the chemistry, CS and physics departments. Um, and this course sort of bridged these two views of quantum mechanics for me. Um, they went through a lot of the physics of how you might represent a qubit, how you might, um, so for example, let's say that you represented a qubit in the spin of an electron. So it's either up or down, and it can be a superposition of up and down. And then how you might say by applying a magnetic field with for a certain amount of time, actually intentionally change the state of that qubit. So in other words, how you might apply an operation or a gate to that qubit. So um, this was a very useful course, sort of bridging the more abstract world of quantum computing and the more sort of concrete world of physical chemistry for me. Um, I was not the only one to notice that this was a, is an important course. Um, this, the course was actually mentioned in a, uh, article on the uh, front page of the Wall Street Journal in 2005. And this was well before quantum computing was making the news um, as, uh, you know, as a big advance. It was sort of more theoretical at this point. Um, but even at that point, this course uh, definitely made, had an influence in terms of um, showing the connection between quantum mechanics and quantum computing. So, um, and one of the innovations I think that's coming out of um, quantum computation and quantum information science um, is that the basic principles of quantum mechanics, superposition, measurement, unitary evolution, you know, they're typically taught in physics classes where the object of study is a hydrogen atom which is very complex. It leads to differential equations to derive those orbitals. It's mathematically very complex, but you can actually teach those basic principles in the context of a qubit. And it's easier to sort of appreciate and work with those basic principles um, with a one zero uh, system instead of a more complex system. So I think um, while quantum uh, computation is obviously going to have an enormous influence on science and industry. It's also having an effect on education and um, and driving innovation in the education realm as well. Okay, so back to this course, I want to sort of say a little bit about what you might learn in a first semester college course on quantum computing. Um, this course uh, taught at Berkeley was covered a lot of the basics and formed the blueprint of many courses around the country, including my own. Um, so what do you learn? So we start out with a bunch of qubit basics and Kanav, as I mentioned, already sort of covered some of those. You know, a qubit can be one or zero, it can be one and zero at the same time, that's superposition. Um, measurement, how you extract the information, unitary evolution, how you, um, the types of operations that you can perform on this data and the important concept of quantum entanglement. Underlying a lot of quantum computing um, is linear algebra. So having a solid background in linear algebra is sort of an essential piece of learning this field and understanding what's going on. So in a typical undergraduate course, I see students who had their linear algebra course but two years prior. So we always do a review to sort of bring them up to speed talk about the circuit model and how you actually compose a, a quantum algorithm by creating a circuit. And we talk about complexity classes. So classes of problems that you might hope to solve with a quantum computer, classes which you could be solved by a classical computer and the difference between the two. We look at one and two bit qubit protocols and these are typically sort of communication protocols between two parties that are trying to either uh, communicate some quantum information or classical information. They may share an entangled pair like Kanav was talking about and you, know, uh, you know, with one particle being on one side and another particle being on the other. Um, these one and two qubit protocols are nice to start out with because it's easier to understand one and two qubits before you start getting into many different qubits. And they also 
illustrate really nicely the power of quantum computing. So the power of entanglement and show that there are certain things that you can do with quantum entanglement that you can't do without it. So it starts to illustrate the, the unique quantum difference. We look at um, query-based algorithms, which are another means of sort of helping us to separate theoretically what we can hope to compute with a quantum computer and uh, that we can't do with a classical. It's actually very difficult to mathematically prove that you can't solve a problem with a classical computer, but you can do it in certain sort of, in these sort of query-based models where your quantum circuit has access to a function and you're asked to learn something about that function. And finally, the major piece of the course is uh, going through some of the major developments in quantum algorithms. Grover search, quantum Fourier transform, Shor's factoring algorithm, phase estimation. These are the core algorithmic pieces, the building blocks of quantum algorithms um, that solve useful and important problems and appear to be able to do much faster on a quantum computer than we can do classically. So this sort of you know, forms the core of the class in which we're actually looking at the underlying algorithms that drive the power of quantum computing. We often include some quantum error correction in our discussions because as kind of mentioned, quantum computers are going to be noisy. So we need some form of means of detecting and correcting quantum errors. So interestingly, we take for granted in the classical world that you can replicate data and think nothing of it. As it turns out in quantum, it's mathematically impossible to create an independent copy of quantum data. And you would think that this would be a serious roadblock for error correction because in classical computers, we do error correction by replicating the data and noticing when there's a discrepancy. Um, so it turns out, even in the quantum world, uh, it is possible to detect and correct errors without measuring and destroying the underlying data. And so there's a beautiful theory of quantum error correction, which will be play an incredibly important role in the future because we will not be able to have full scale quantum computers without error correction. So this is the basic outline of what you might cover in a in an undergraduate or graduate course, first course on quantum computing. Um, I should also say that I uh, sat in on uh, John Preskill's uh, Physics 219 at Caltech as well, and that was also an influential course for me. This is a two-quarter sequence. There are some very nice course notes online, so you can Google it and find his course notes. And since it's a little bit more time, he goes into more physics, more about fault-tolerant quantum computing, more about quantum information science and physical implementation. So um, if you're interested, I recommend you look up those course notes because they're quite, they're quite useful. So I had taught a course like this, the graduate level for very many years. And last year I decided that I wanted to teach it at the undergraduate level. Um, so uh, you know, previously my quantum classes had say a dozen students, um, dozen say PhD master students. And I decided that I was gonna um, offer the course at the undergraduate level. And I had 75 students, um, which actually by UC Irvine standards is a small course, but it was a lot for quantum. And um, going into it, I wasn't sure exactly how to adapt the material from the graduate level to the undergraduate. So I decided to introduce a programming uh, component to the class. I use Qiskit as the sort of language, which is IBM's um, software development kit. Um, and I got to know Qbraid as a result of this because I decided to use the Qbraid platform. Um, it was amazing. Uh, it made the programming aspect really easy because all 75 students were up and running immediately, as kind of said. There was no uh, debugging with installing Qiskit or various dealing with different computing systems. And also these 75 students I had in my class came from diverse backgrounds. So I had physics majors, math majors, CS majors, and I couldn't assume anything about prior programming experience, but you don't need it. So everybody was able to get up and running right away, creating quantum circuits, experimenting with the ideas um, in no time at all without an extensive programming background. So that was um, made the course uh, much, much easier to teach. Um, 
Here's an example of what a lab might look like. And um, so this is phase estimation, which is a little bit abstract, but um, the input to phase estimation is some mystery operator, U, and a state. And what we're asked to output is the eigenvalue of the state. If you don't know what, an, what that means, don't worry too much about it. But the basic idea is that I provided for the students these, these gates that you see here in pink. And those gates contain some operation uh, which they can access. So they can provide an input and get the output of that operation inside their quantum circuit, okay? And so this is provided for them. And then what they have to do is build the quantum circuit around it for phase estimation that will figure out something about this function. So they have to actually derive this value theta through their circuit. So we cover this algorithm in class. It's always a little confusing for the students. It's a hard to understand, but then they get in and they actually program it themselves and they create the circuit and they measure the output and they get a sense of exactly how the algorithm works as a result. And then part of the written assignment is actually asking them, so you measured this, what does that mean? How do you interpret the results? Um, and it helps them sort of play with and understand this material. Um, on my student evaluations, um, they always ask the question, which, which aspects of the class did you feel contributed the most to your learning? And the labs came up repeatedly. So labs were great, helped me visualize the quantum algorithms. Uh, the labs helped me the most as they let me experiment with how certain gates and inputs would affect the circuit as a whole. The labs helped me make sure I was understanding concepts correctly. So quantum programming will be an incredibly important tool in the future in terms of research and experimentation. It's also useful as a pedagogical tool in understanding the theoretical underpinnings of quantum algorithms. So it was um, very powerful in this class and I will always now uh, include some type of programming aspect to quantum courses that I teach in the future. Um, now, a lot of what I've talked about here, um, the algorithms that we've looked at in this class are looking at the questions of what can we do with an idealized quantum computer? Full scale, error corrected quantum computer. This will be a quantum computer of the future. We do not have these yet, um, but it's in still an incredibly important question to ask. We don't fully understand, even when we can build these things in and correct errors and build them with thousands of qubits, we don't fully have a grasp of what their true power is over classical. So this is an incredibly important area to explore, but equally important is now in the last, you know, uh, five to 10 years, we've actually had uh, examples of quantum computers that we can actually work with. Um, so a more immediate question is what can we do with a hundred noisy qubits? So there's gonna be errors. Um, the number of qubits is limited, but still 100 qubits can theoretically store two to the 100 complex numbers, which is much more than you can actually store on a classical computer. So what we're interested now for the immediate future is how can we harness these uh, not quite yet mature machines, but still very powerful to, to perform and compute problems that we'd like to solve. And one of the uh, likely initial applications will be simulating uh, physics and chemistry. And so we call these uh, uh, the quantum computers of the current generation NISC computers, noisy intermediate scale quantum computers. So let me just say a little bit about the problem of uh, quantum simulation. Jaju is actually gonna talk later about this today. So um, I don't wanna steal too much of his thunder, but here's a basic problem that underlines a lot of numerical and computational work in chemistry and physics. So you're given as input to your problem, a description of the energy interaction between particles in a quantum system. So a condensed matter physicist might more typically look at sort of a grid of particles, which have some, for example, electron spin. And uh, as input to the problem, we understand sort of the energy interaction between nearby particles. So we understand sort of how these two affect each other energetically along each of these edges here. And what we wanna do is given those energy interactions, I wanna understand which quantum state has the lowest energy. 
overall over the entire system. And keep in mind, if I had a hundred little particles here, actually representing this quantum state would require two to the 100 complex numbers. So this is not a feasible thing to even store the state on a classical computer, let alone solve this optimization problem. In the context of chemistry, this might be a molecule and you have the, um, the equations for the kinetic and the potential energy between the electrons in the system and between the electrons and the neutrons. And you wanna find out exactly what is the lowest energy configuration of this molecule. Some form of this problem underlines a vast amount of work in chemistry and physics and is incredibly important in material design, drug design, all kinds of important problems in physical sciences. We do not expect there to be a, a provable algorithm that can solve this problem. So, so in that sense, theory is not gonna help us in that we don't expect for very strong theoretical reasons that there won't be an algorithm that we can solve this in its full generality and prove that it works efficiently. So what we have to do is develop, it doesn't mean that the problem goes away just because we don't have a general solution to it. So what we have to do is to work with special cases and develop heuristics that will work well in many cases of interest. Um, and for that, we need to be able to program different solutions and evaluate them. And this is why programming now is becoming an essential piece of uh, research. So one of the algorithms that's on the sort of an algorithmic paradigm that's of great interest these days is the variational quantum eigensolver. And, and again, Jaji will talk more about this this afternoon, but let's say we have a quantum circuit that creates a state. It has certain parameters. So if I change these parameters, it produces a different state. So I'm gonna use my quantum computer to prepare a particular state based on a set of parameters. So I'm tuning these different gates according to the parameters. I measure the energy. And now I wanna optimize. Now I wanna tweak these parameters so that my quantum circuit produces a lower energy state. And this is a classical, uh, a classical um, quantum hybrid algorithm because I'm using my quantum computer to produce a state. And then I'm doing some optimization in the classical side to actually tune and optimize these parameters and we repeat. So this is not something that we will prove actually finds the lowest ground state, but in many cases, we hope that it will actually be successful in producing useful results. Um, so this, this process is repeated many times. And another nice feature of this particular algorithm is that it produces low depth circuits. So remember, kind of talked about the fact that noise is a huge factor in quantum computing. Um, and uh, the, the uh, longer the depth of the circuit, so which is sort of the number of gates from the start to the finish, the more noise that gets introduced. So we're looking for as low depth circuits as we can possibly get. And the VQE uh, paradigm tends to produce sort of lower depth circuits, which is another good thing in terms of uh, reducing noise on the current generation of computers. So this is an example of where programming circuits is gonna be an incredibly important piece of ongoing work and leveraging the power of quantum computing. So uh, as the hardware develops, um, the field is diversifying. So as the technology advances and it's happening at, at just a, an incredibly alarming rate. I mean, I don't think any of us foresaw where it would be going uh, in the last few years. Um, the education and what we include in a quantum computing course is also changing accordingly. Also, there are a greater diversity of courses out there in order to address this rapidly developing field. So one of the things that you'll see is that there will be a heavier emphasis on programming in quantum computing classes. And you're seeing now uh, already a handful of courses that are specifically uh, quantum programming classes. And you start right out of the gate programming and you get um, hands-on experience with algorithms like VQE. Um, 
you're also going to see courses covering uh, more of these hybrid quantum classical algorithms. DQE is one example, QAOA is another one. And these are uh, sort of algorithmic paradigms that we hope will harness the power of these near-term quantum computers for, I talked about quantum simulation, but we're also hoping to use them for just general optimization problems, for machine learning, and all kinds of other applications. So, and these, by their nature, will be evaluated using experimentation and by numerical means. So, um, programming is going to play a pretty critical role in that, um, in that sort of developing the algorithms, evaluating them, and understanding how to improve them in the future. Quantum benchmarking is also another uh, really important and in starting to make its way into sort of the undergraduate and graduate level curriculum. So this is looking at the question of how you model noise that occurs on a quantum computer and how do you evaluate the frequency of different types of errors on a particular device. And it's also closely related to the idea of establishing that quantum computers, despite the noise, are competing something that we believe to be uh, impossible for classical computers to do in a reasonable amount of time. So, you know, you've got your quantum computer that's doing something. How do you tell actually that it's computing something that you can't do on a classical computer? So there's noise in there, but is there enough um, information in there that it looks like it's solving a problem or at least sampling from some distribution or performing some task that we believe that classical counterparts can't do. Um, and also as the technology evolves, we're gonna need to understand more about how to build the analog of the layers of abstraction that we have in the classical computer. So in classical computing, uh, we start with say an abstract algorithm. It gets programmed in some programming language like Python or C. And then it gets compiled through various layers down to the actual hardware of the machine that it's going to be running on. So this is sort of a stack of abstraction that has been developed over the course of decades in the context of classical computers. Um, now we don't know exactly what the architecture of the underlying technology or the underlying technology of quantum computers will be. Um, but we still need to actually perform something similar to this translation. So we start out with an abstract model for an algorithm. We might specify that in the form of a circuit in Qiskit, but ultimately that has to get translated down to the hardware level. And those qubits on a particular device are sitting at particular locations and um, how to actually do this mapping in a way that minimizes noise and minimizes computing time is a growing and important field. So um, how to actually do this translation so that qubits that need to be operated on together are actually physically close to each other on the chip um, and that you can use operations that say some operations are cheaper than other operations, how to sort of minimize the expensive ones. Um, all of these sort of low level things that involve translating an abstract algorithm down to the hardware are becoming increasingly important. And um, it, I'm seeing more courses uh, addressing these sort of systems type issues in quantum computers. Um, and also just many system courses now have a, a little quantum component to them where they sort of address some of these issues. But as the technology develops, we're gonna need to develop more and more of sort of the, the, what we know already about classical algorithms, we're gonna to have to develop sort of quantum analogs to those. Um, I didn't put error correction on the slide, but that's yet another important uh, topic that, that is you know, becoming now prominent in, in courses that you'll see um, on quantum computing. And so we're not yet at the point where we can actually implement error correction protocols in a quantum computer. Um, that can detect when an error has happened and then automatically correct it. This will be an actual critical component of future generations because qubits will be inherently noisy. Um, this is one of the biggest challenges is to actually be able to um, detect and correct errors um, and have a, a robust approach to fault tolerant, tolerant computing. So 
I hope I have convinced you that there's really a wide array of different and important questions to explore in quantum computing. And the exciting thing is that um, there's going to be more curricular offerings developed in the coming years that will make these questions accessible and a, provide a way to enter the field and work on many of these really important challenges. So thank you for your time and attention. I guess I can take questions at this point if people have them. Yeah, thank you, Sandy. Uh, as a reminder, um, and I think we had a question come in about the quantum error cor correction with regards to Google's thesis. So I don't know if you want to touch on that more specifically after uh, the statement you just made, which is, you know, Google implied at their last event that they need a thousand physical qubits to obtain a single error corrected yeah. logical qubit. Do you think that's seems reasonable or? That is sort of approximately the figure that I've heard. So yes, okay. it will take. Um, and then, you know, to implement, say, Shor's factoring algorithm, we need a thousand logical qubits to do that. So you think about each one of those logical qubits then needing a thousand physical qubits. That's a million qubits to implement uh, Shor's factoring algorithm. So um, that's why the, the error correction is so important and scaling is so important as well. Now we do have a, a few questions that have come in um, since we do have a pretty significant academic audience joining us today. Okay. Uh, there's a few questions in that realm. Um, what can a student expect to be able to do after taking a, quant a course in quantum computation? Um, so it's a huge field. I mean, I, you, you don't become an expert after one course. After, even after 10 years of studying, I'm continually overwhelmed at how little I know and how much more I need to learn. So, um, but I, you know, the students who took my course were up and running right away, creating quantum circuits and programming. So you could, for example, already get in the game of um, exploring different variations of VQE and you know, uh, ground state preparation. Um, so a lot of these sort of hybrid quantum classical algorithms, you're already in a position to start you know, understanding them, programming them, tuning them. So um, it, in terms of the programming, it's actually amazingly easy to get up and running. Now, of course, you need sort of an understanding of the underlying chemistry or physics of the problem that you're solving, which actually takes more time. Um, but the programming actually comes quite easily. So I, I think, you know, even after a course, you can, you're pretty, it's, it's not hard to actually work with quantum circuits at that point. Is there a link to uh, sign up for, for the course? So my course is um, a UC Irvine course. So um, I will be teaching it in the winter and I don't know if there's sort of uh, open access to it. I think there might be, actually we do have, um, an extension where you can take some of these courses. There are also a bunch of really great courses out there on Coursera and edX and such. So um, uh, there are a lot of really great online courses through the MOOC platforms that are around these days as well. I actually learned, you know, I started when I was learning quantum computers sitting in my silo here at UC Irvine. Um, I just downloaded course notes and read the notes. And you know, actually as a you know, full professor, 25 years into my career, I was doing the homework assignments and you know, that's what it took to actually sort of really sort of get in and start working on things. So um, I did it through paper and pencil sort of the old fashioned way, but nowadays there's a lot more video options out there. So uh, I don't know if you can address this question, but we have a question came in about uh, what do you think about IBM's roadmap to build that thousand qubits quality control? Um, so I know less about the hardware and the prospects of that. Um, th all I can say is that we're sort of continually surprised at how fast things are moving. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if they're able to do that. I mean, we, I don't think, you know, several years ago, I don't think we saw the 53 qubit machine happening. So um, things are happening at just incredibly rapid pace. So, so, so it, getting back to the education side of things, then uh, how critical do you think it is for graduating CS majors or I guess, or even graduating with physics, chemistry, you know, uh, all of these
fields to have some sort of exposure to quantum computation or or programming? Like, do you think that's something worthwhile exploring now or in professional development later? I think it's definitely worthwhile to explore now. So I don't think necessarily, like if you graduate in the next few years and you don't know how to program in quantum computing, you're going to be like, I can't get a job on the job market. So it's not, it's not quite that at that point of criticality. I think it's an incredible opportunity right now because the field is, is at such an incredibly exciting time, growth time. So um, it's a great opportunity to get involved in this field, which will be expanding rapidly over the next few years. That being said, I also think that in the next 10 to 20 years, having some literacy in quantum computing will be important. It's going to be an important factor in tech uh, in the next decades. And so having some sort of basic understanding of how quantum computers work will be part of being sort of tech literate. It's hard to pick it up as a professional. I think it's easier to do as a student when you actually have the discipline of doing homework sets. And, you know, um, so I recommend doing it now to get that grounding um, so that you always have that background going forward. So, uh, so talking to that point, I guess, what, what do you see are some of the most significant barriers maybe to learning about quantum computation and I mean, really understanding the, the algorithms requires some mathematical background. Um, so linear algebra is an incredibly important piece. And the understanding the algorithms inherently depends on a pretty good grounding in linear algebra. Um, at UCI, our students are required to take it as part of a CS major. So I assume they have it coming in. Of course, they've all forgotten it because they've had it two years before they take my course. So we do a review, um, but it does make it a little challenging, say at the high school level. I mean, you can get a little bit of a sense of what, uh, you know, quantum algorithms and circuits and what they do, um, but it really does help to have a little bit of a linear algebra grounding before you get into the field. So that's one of sort of the essential pieces, I would say. But other than that, there's no serious barriers to learning about the field. So um, maybe, maybe yeah. I'll take it uh, to a slightly different level, uh, knowing that something at our organization that we're highly engaged in is just in general trying to promote the next generation of computer scientists by getting these concepts down into, you know, the junior high and high school levels and not just waiting for, you know, higher uh, academia. Um, what, do you think that it's reasonably possible to start introducing either some of these concepts or getting into some of the uh, computational methods at those age groups as well? Absolutely. I mean, QRA ran a very successful set of courses to high school students over the summer. Um, and I think the students coming out of that got a sense of, were able to sort of start programming quantum circuits and a, a sense of what you know quantum computing is all about. Um, maybe they didn't quite have the background to go into, you know, full-blown Shor's factoring algorithm or some of the, the more difficult concepts, but a lot can be already covered um, at the high school level. Um, I, I'm going to get on my soapbox a little bit. So I, um, in terms of high school cur math curriculum, I think there should be a much heavier emphasis on sort of tech-related math, like discrete math, statistics, and linear algebra. Um, potentially at the expense of learning, you know, calculus at the high school level. So I think, you know, uh, our, our high school curriculum is a little bit slow to move from, from one era to the next. So I would love to see more kinds of, you know, uh, math for the digital era offered already at the high school level and emphasize more, but that's my own private little uh, <laughs> agenda. So well, we, we, we appreciate that opinion okay. <laughs> on our end. So um, we have a, a one more question that came in from the audience. Um, so the, the participant is saying that uh, they took an introductory course on uh, quantum computation through IBM. Mm -hmm. uh, now they're pursuing an MS in operational research and optimization techniques. Uh, do you have any suggestions for how they can connect these two to help the research community? Or um, are there specific courses for QAOA presently that you're aware of? or could I suggest? don't know of anything right that sort of hits that niche of like optimization, QAOA, 
quantum programming. I mean, I think you could sort of piece it together from various sources. I would look, um, there's a, I don't think there's going to be a course on QAOA, but there are courses on quantum programming. And one of the things that you can start to program right away is QAOA. So that might be a good way to sort of at least get sort of some, you know, a few weeks of content from some of those quantum programming courses. Um, and the literature is surprisingly accessible. So you can, you can actually get in and sort of um, start to look at some of the research papers that are out there. So it's, it's a very active area for research. So you can go on the archive and, and uh, start looking up, looking up research papers on the topic, so. And though I know you've maybe covered some of these elements, uh, maybe it'd be good to um, wrap things up with just a, a general question about what, what excites you for the future with regards to education in this sphere and kind of what are some of the things you see uh, coming up in maybe the next two, five, 10 years? Um, so yeah, in terms of the education piece, um, I plan to sort of develop more labs and I think it's a great way for students to sort of get hands-on and more project-oriented courses. So a follow-on to the course I taught might have students doing more um, exploring their own projects and doing a little bit of research themselves. So that's something that I would be very excited to do um, and to help sort of students connect with, you know, topics that interest them and sort of create an experiment around them and program them. So that's something I would be really sort of interested in doing for the future. Um, and, you know, I'm still a theory person at heart. So I'm still really interested in using program to help teach the, the algorithm side. Um, and there's a lot of interesting questions still on the theory side of, you know, in the long run, we don't, we don't have a great understanding yet in what the ultimate power of these machines will be. So um, that's something that I'm still very interested in thinking about, so. Well, great. I, I know on behalf of uh, Brick that we're incredibly thankful and grateful that you're willing to join us today. and share this information has definitely informed us, like I said, as we go forward, trying to push these types of programs into, I think for our focus, really getting into the junior high and high school levels, at least in the, the US. Um, so yeah, thank you, thank pleasure. you very much. Thank you for having me, it's great. Yeah, we appreciate it. Okay, well, thank you to Sandy and we will now gear up for our next presentation at the top of the hour with James Whitfield.